Hello, everybody. In this session, I'm going to talk to you about some of the technology and some of the features that you find in the Nikon Z mount lenses. Now, obviously, the Nikon Z mount itself is relatively new, and Z mount lenses themselves are coming out time and time again. There's more and more lenses all the time. Now, it can be sometimes a little bit hard to keep up with all the different lenses, all the different technology changes, and so on. Nikon's F mount lenses have been around for literally years, tens of years. Nikon decided to obviously move to Z mount lenses with the arrival of the new mirrorless systems and the new, therefore, a new mirrorless Z mount. You can obviously still use your existing F mount lenses on your mirrorless cameras if you want to via an FTZ, but realistically, the Z mount lenses are going to are going to allow you to get the most that you can out of your camera. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the new Z mount lenses. I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that you might not know about these lenses. Now, the great thing is as well is that we've just had these two new lenses announced. So along with the Z9, Nikon also announced a new 24 to 120 f4 which was a bit of a surprise actually because for a long time nikon convinced people that this was going to be a 24 to 105 but it is actually a 24 to 120 so we get a little bit of extra reach at that long end and it is a constant f4 which is really nice i definitely know there's a lot of photographers that are already interested in this lens because a lot of people do feel like a 24 to 70 can be a little bit short Yes, a 24 to 70 can have the benefit of being an f 2.8, but the 24 to 120 is an f4, gives you a little bit of a longer range, and it really allows you to get much closer to further distant subjects. There is obviously a 24 to 70 f4 that already exists, and I know that there'll be lots of people that are interested to see the difference between this lens and a 24 to 70 f4. But a little bit of insight. Nikon expect the 24 to 120 f4 to be up, up to the level of quality that you expect from the 24 to 70 f4. There will still be a little bit of a quality improvement when it comes to a 24 to 72.8, but how great that improvement is remains to be seen. So I would expect this to stand up incredibly well against the other Z mount lenses, mainly because it's what is called an S lens. So Nikon have a range of S lenses in their lineup of Z mount lenses. These S lenses are the higher quality denoted lenses and there are some lenses that don't have that S denotion to them. These will be still really good picture quality but they might not have all of the coatings, they might not be as big or as fast when it comes to apertures. They might generally be a little bit darker in some cases as well. Now as a whole, Nikon have launched some incredibly good Z mount lenses. A lot of the lenses that already exist for the Z cameras are best in class. There's a couple of things like the 50mm 1.8, which is an incredibly good prime, incredibly sharp and incredibly well detailed. There's a standout for the 24 to 70 f 2.8. There's also a standout for the 14 to 24 2.8 and the 70 to 200 2.8, which collectively gives you one of the best trinity of lenses that you can buy. They're all incredibly good quality and offer some of the best picture quality that you can find. Now, where do these two new lenses sit? 24 to 120 obviously sits within that normal range of a 24 wide angle and then a bit of zoom on top of that. So realistically, this is for people, events, maybe not so much wildlife doesn't really give you as much of a zoom or a reach for wildlife photography. Wildlife is probably where something like this 100 to 400 would come, would come in. There's a lot of people who have been waiting for this 100 to 400. I definitely know that from from talking to photographers and seeing comments because before this 100 to 400 the longest that Nikon had was a 70 to 200 you can put a 70 to 200 with a teleconverter to take it to a 400 but it's not the same as having a dedicated long telephoto lens so Nikon have finally announced a 100 to 400 this is a variable aperture lens so unlike the 24 to 120 which is a constant f4 the variable aperture of the 100 to 400 is an f 4.5 to 5.6. So what does that mean? Well, those of you that know about lenses will know that when you zoom them in, some lenses will have a constant and some lenses will have a variable aperture. So as I'm zooming this 100 to 400 in, its aperture setting is changing. Now, that does mean that you effectively have a 100 f 4.5 and you also then have a 400 f 5.6. So as far as wildlife is concerned, 400 is definitely a really nice focal length. There might be some sections of wildlife where you need a little bit longer. I do a lot of wildlife photography myself, and I do thoroughly enjoy using a 500 or a 600, but it does depend on the subject that you're shooting. Sports is definitely going to be covered by a 100 to 400. In a lot of situations, you might even need a little bit wider. So depending on what you shoot, the 100 to 400 can really bring subjects in much closer to you and still give you great quality. 
Granted, it's not going to be as fast as a 2.8 or a constant f4 lens, but the big advantage is its size and weight. That variable aperture means that the 100 to 400 can be much smaller and lighter than other much larger constant f4 lenses, especially when you look at some of the f-mount lenses that exist, like a 180 to 400 and so on. Now, if you did need an even longer lens, the 100 to 400 benefits from the fact that you can use it with teleconverters. So on the back of the 100 to 400, you can place a teleconverter. Now, the Z mount system has a 1.4 and a 2 times teleconverter. So if we were to use this with the 1.4 times teleconverter, and we were to use this lens at 400 mil, we would get an, eff an effective focal length of 560 millimeters, and our aperture would change from 5.6 to f8. If we were to use this with a 2 times teleconverter, we would then effectively take our 400 millimeter focal length to an effective range of 800 millimeters. Our aperture would then change to f11, so it is going to be quite dark. But especially with higher ISO performance on newer cameras, that f11 isn't necessarily as bad as it sounds. There are a lot of situations where cameras are improving when it comes to higher ISO, and they're also improving when it comes to autofocus. Mirrorless cameras find it easier to focus at f11 way easier, in fact, compared to DSLRs. There are some DSLRs that can't focus at f11. So don't be afraid to use this lens with teleconverters if you do need that extra reach. Do keep in mind, though, that when you do use teleconverters, there will always be a small amount of picture quality loss. Depending on how much detail you need or how much cropping you need, that might not be a problem or it might might well make your shot too dark, depending on the situations that you're shooting in. So always consider the changes that a teleconverter will make to your image. Also keep in mind that the purpose of a teleconverter is to give you that effective longer focal length without you needing to crop in. There are many situations where you might have already a high megapixel camera. If you're a Z7 or a Z7 II shooter, for example, you're in a situation where you could zoom your lens to 400 and then crop in using that megapixel count to give you that closer zoom, effectively. That might still give you better quality than using a teleconverter, but it will definitely give you a lower megapixel count. And that's something that's really important to keep in mind, because if your final image needs to be a large print and you need that full megapixel count, I would go for a teleconverter. If you're not too concerned about that final pixel count, if you're not too concerned about needing a large print, then maybe you could look at using your megapixel count instead, cropping in instead of using a teleconverter. So there are always positives and negatives around the way that you get there, but this 100 to 400 is kind of the first entry into a longer lens for the Z mount, and I know that there's a lot of people that have been waiting for this lens for an incredibly long time. Now, the, you will definitely see that there's a couple of different features that we have on this 100 to 400 that are not on the 24 to 120. A couple of things to keep in mind that on a lot of Z mount lenses, we will have a display or a small display on the lens itself. This is really useful for displaying things like your exact focal length, also really useful for displaying your focusing distances, and you can also use it as an aperture display. So if you do want to see what your aperture is on your lens, you can use the display to do that. As I mentioned, we also have our zoom barrel at the front on the 100 to 400. We then have a focusing ring. We then have a function ring. So this function ring is customizable. We can assign that function ring to things like exposure, aperture, ISO. There's a number of different functions. And then the 100 to 400 will also have function buttons. So we'll have a lens function 1 and a lens function 2. Now, that function 1 and function 2 are completely customizable to you. It's a basically a, a photographer's customizable button. The lens function 2 buttons do rotate around the lens, so you can see that we have them all the way around the lens as well. Now, what would you use those function buttons for? Why might you need those? Well, a couple of things that I use them for from a wildlife photography perspective is sometimes I actually quite like to have an AF on on a button, on a lens. So if I can't quite get to my AF on on the back of the camera, or if I'm using a particularly longer lens and I want to focus from the lens, sometimes I quite like the idea of pushing in the button on the lens, the camera focuses, I don't have to worry about getting to the back button focus and I can then just fire with the shutter button when I need to. So sometimes I like to do it that way. You can also use these buttons for a focusing lock if you wanted to as well. So there's a number of different things you can customize in there. As with all long lenses, you can limit their focusing distances because 
when it comes to long lenses, you're either working in a distance where you can be much further away from your subject, and then you just won't focus on anything close. So let's say, for example, you're focusing on a distant subject, and there might be a patch of grass or a tree or a mound in your foreground, and you don't want the, the lens to refocus on that patch in the foreground when your subject's moving around. So you can limit the distance that the lens will focus at. So we have this switch on the side of the lens. We would set this to full, and that would allow the lens to fully focus throughout its entire range. Or we could set that to 3 meters to infinity. So anything that is closer than 3 meters, the lens will not focus on. But anything that is further away than 3 meters to infinity, the lens will then focus on distant subjects specifically. So you can tell the camera to prioritize subjects in the distance rather than subjects coming up close to you. Please do keep in mind, though, that if you're photographing things like birds in flight or moving animals, you'd be a bit concerned if something did start running at you and got a little bit close to you. But realistically, if it's within three meters, you would need to make sure that switch is set correctly. Now, moving back to the smaller 120 to, sorry, the smaller 24 to 120. I was going to say 120 to 400 there. So moving back to the smaller 24 to 120, this is a lens that doesn't have as many of those features. We obviously don't need a switch for distances because it's not a longer focal length. We do have a switch for focusing, which is really nice and simple. We also then have a lens function button. So like the 100 to 400 that has lots of lens function buttons, this only has one. But I'm glad that it has that one because it really separates it from some of our other smaller lenses. There are a lot of other smaller zoom lenses that we have in our Z-mount range that don't always have these lens function buttons. So what can you customize on this 24 to 120? Well, right at the front, we have our focusing ring. So the very first ring is a focusing ring. We can turn that off if we don't want to use it as a manual focusing ring. We then have our zoom ring, which is really nice and straightforward, it allows us to zoom all the way from 24 to 120. We then have our customized lens function button as well. This customized lens function button really allows you to control settings quickly just by pressing that button on the left-hand side of the lens. And then behind that, we have our control ring. So again, this is the same function ring that we find on the 100 to 400. It is something that is the same across most Nikon lenses. So this lens function ring is something that you'll find in most of them. There are some that don't have this function ring, but you can definitely keep an eye out for it on the larger zoom lenses. You'll generally find that function ring. Now, one of the things that the 24 to 120 does not have, it doesn't have that display. So it doesn't have that kind of top panel display. I feel like that's a good thing on this lens because it does mean it can be a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter. And, and especially for the, for the lens that it is, people just want a 24 to 120 to be more usable, a little bit smaller and a little bit lighter. And keep in mind that it is just an F, a constant F4. It's not a... 24 to 120 f 2.8, that would be a lot bigger. The 24 to 70 2.8 is a lot bigger than the 24 to 70 f 4. So that f 4 does mean that it can be a smaller lens, and we then obviously get the benefit of that extra focal length to help as well. So that gives you a bit of an introduction into these two lenses. Now, as a whole, why are Z lenses so good? There's a couple of reasons for that. As I mentioned at the start, that whole redesign of mount that Nikon decided to do, there was that situation where Nikon thought to themselves, oh, you know what? We are going to have to move to mirrorless, and that does mean that we're going to need to design a new mount, and we might as well make the mount the best it can be. And the Z mount lenses that have been released so far have really been a, a, you know, a, a, an example of that. They've really been a standout set of lenses. Yes, we are still waiting for certain focal lengths that people want. We still need even longer than a 100 to 400. I'm really excited about some of the lenses that are on, are on the roadmap already. But realistically, there should be most focal lengths to easily cover a lot of people's needs. There's a range of 1.8s. There's f1.2 lenses, so a 50 millimeter f1.2. There's a range of zooms. And our zooms go all the way from 14 all the way up to now a 100 to 400. And then we also have the ability to you know, expand on that Z mount range of lenses into the future. So one of the things that Nikon has updated and provided recently is an updated lens roadmap. So when it comes to that lens roadmap, it's always worth just double checking. It's always just worth seeing what's on that lens roadmap and just double checking when it does get updated, what new lenses are being added. There are some interesting things on the new Z lens roadmap. One thing that really stands out to me is a new 800mm. Now, in all honesty, 
I've not seen this 800 mil, but I would really like to. I'm really excited about what that 800 mil means, especially from a wildlife photographer perspective. When it comes to that 800 millimeter focal length, really great for small birds and small woodland birds in flight and things like that. Currently use a lot of a 600 mil focal length, but there is going to be a Z 600 mil focal length in the future as well. So there are lots of lenses that are to come. When it comes to distinguishing between what lens is going to be right for you and best to choose from, the, the biggest giveaway is generally always the aperture. So if it's a 1.2, it's generally going to be one of the best performing lenses you can buy, but it's also going to be larger and it's going to be heavier. If it's a 1.8, it's going to be a little bit smaller, it's going to be a little bit lighter. The quality is still going to be absolutely fantastic. I think one of the things that sometimes people get a little bit confused by with Z-mount lenses is that there is a range of 1.8s, but Nikon don't make any Z-mount 1.4s. With previous F-mount lenses, the F-mount 1.4s were seen as kind of the, the best of the best lenses. And I generally feel like that's, that's changed now. The 1.8s take that position of those 1.4s. Obviously, they are still 1.8, so their aperture is still 1.8. But it takes that, that, especially that spiritual position of the performance of the lens. So those range of 1.8 lenses that are available for the Z-mount, there's a 20 a 24, a 35, a 50, and an 85, that whole range of lenses will give you incredibly good quality, better than F-mount 1.4 lenses in a lot of cases. And then if you do need even higher quality, if you need the ability to go to even higher than those 1.8 lenses, or you might need a brighter lens, then we have the 50mm F1.2. There's also another 85mm on the roadmap, but we are unsure as to what the aperture of that 85mm lens is. But it's quite likely that that could also be a, quite a bright, fast lens. So there's going to be situations where you're going to look for what lens is right for you or what lenses you might think you might need. And there should be a lens that is going to make the choice of your shooting with Z-mount and Z-mount lenses really easy. And I'm sure over time you might develop your favorite lenses. There are lenses that I really like within the Z-mount range, the 50mm 1.8 being one of them. This new 100 to 400 I'm really starting to like as well. Now this 24 to 120 doesn't really fit with my shooting style, but it is quite small and compact for the range that it covers. So it could be a really nice flexible travel lens and a lens just to take with you that would easily cover so many different scenarios. So I'm really interested to see how this lens performs as well. Now, one thing that um, a lot of photographers always ask about when it comes to lenses is autofocus performance. How do we know that our lens is going to focus fast? Well, a couple of things can help you with that. Some of the Z-mount lenses will have one single focusing motor, but the vast majority of them will have two focusing motors in them as well. So if a Z-mount lens does have two focusing motors, generally you will not only get a much, a much faster response from the focusing system, but you also get a much smoother and cleaner response from the focusing system. When you ask the camera to focus, it accurately focuses straight away. You don't get that kind of hunting of the single focusing motor. So keeping an eye out for which Z lenses include two focusing motors can always give you a little bit of an insight as to how quickly that lens is going to focus and also keeping an insight into what camera you're using on will make a little bit of a difference as well especially if it's something like a z9 but the focusing motors do play a really important part in that z mount lenses are not just only designed for stills though we've spoken a lot about photography we've spoken a lot about photography use cases and so on but there's also a lot of use cases for video and it, pretty much every z mount lens is not just made for photography but also made with video in mind at the same time. So when it comes to video shooting what advancements do these Z mount lenses have? Well first of all they're all silent. Um, it's very rare to find a Z mount lens that generates quite a bit of noise that the camera can pick up through a microphone. So they are all considerably quieter than their F mount counterparts and some of them literally are completely silent. The second thing is that very few of the Z-mount lenses exhibit any lens breathing. You might not know what lens breathing is, but when you effectively change your focus position from one subject to another, you may have seen this in um, documentaries or you may have seen it in filming where there's a subject in the foreground and there's then a subject in the background. And ability, basically the cameraman will shift focus from front to back or from back to front. And what can happen in some lenses when you do that, the lens will breathe. It can either lose focal length or it can get wider. So the the actual frame itself can change and that can be distracting to the viewer. 
there are a lot of lenses that do breathe, but the vast majority of ZMAT lenses do not. And they are incredibly useful for video users because of that. You'd be surprised once you've noticed breathing on a lens, you can't really ever not see it again. So it can be quite distracting if you have seen a lens that does breathe. Um, the 100 to 400, for example, does not exhibit any breathing, whether it's at 100 or 400. So lens breathing is something that is vital and really important for video users. It can also play um, a part when it comes to stacking. So if any photographers are interested in focus stacking, you can also then have to compensate for breathing when you're stacking images together because you're effectively seeing a portion of the image get larger or smaller as that breathing occurs. So not only are they silent, not only then do they not breathe, they, much, they make it much easier to move focus from one subject to another, but they then still offer the exact same focusing performance and the ability to focus quickly in video as they do in stills. You're not in a situation where it works great in stills, but then all of a sudden it's not very good in video. So you have that ability to make sure that it's always kind of at its fastest from a video point of view as well. Again, doesn't really matter what camera you're using on, whether it's a Z6, Z7, or if it's a Z9. All of those Z cameras have the ability to customize their focusing speed. So if you're in a situation where you're recording video and you want the lens to purposefully focus slower, you can do so. And if you're in a situation where you want to purposefully make the lens focus faster, you can change that setting. These are all settings that are available and customizable in your camera, but they directly affect the lens that you're using. So always keep an eye out for some of those more detailed auto focusing settings, especially around video, because there's a couple of those settings that only affect video. They they don't affect the still side of things. So we know these lenses focus fast. We know that they are great for video and they are great for stills. So the, the next question is, you know, how do you decide what focal length is right for you? Well, the biggest question we always get is, you know, is this lens better than this lens? Or should I use that lens? Or should I take that lens? And it's a tough one for an outside person to answer without knowing what it is that you specifically shoot. But one of the easiest things that it, you can do, especially if you've got a zoom lens, is take a look at what your most used focal lengths are. So let's say, for example, that you have a 24 to 120 and you want to know what next lens to buy. If you take a look at your most used focal lengths, and you can do this by just checking in the metadata in the images that you've taken if you use um, editing software that allows you to filter through metadata, it's really easy to do. If that metadata then comes back and says that you've taken 10 pictures at 24 mil, you've taken 10 pictures at 120 millimeters, but you've taken 100 pictures at 85, you might want to consider an 85 1.8 because clearly that's a focal length that you enjoy using. Other than that, it then comes down to the technical aspects of them. And whoever you ask will always have their own personal opinion. You know, if someone asked me the difference between a 35 1.8 and a 50 millimeter 1.8, I would always say the 50 millimeter 1.8 is better because I prefer a 50 millimeter focal length. If you asked another photographer, they might say the 35 millimeter 1.8 is better because they might prefer the 35 millimeter 1.8. So there is always a little bit of um, customization when it comes to which focal length is going to be right for you. But there are ways that you can find out which focal length is going to be right, whether you're in a situation where you need a new wide angle lens or if you're in a situation where you need a new zoom lens. The other thing that people sometimes get caught up on is what aperture should they go to? It's like some people might compare a 50 millimeter 1.2 to a 50 millimeter 1.8. Is that extra 1.2 worth the size, the weight, compared to the 1.8, which is much smaller and lighter. Do we get that much better quality? And the answer to that, again, comes back to how are you going to shoot? If you're buying a 1.2 lens, but you're mainly going to stop it down and shoot it at f2, you might as well just bought the 1.8 lens. So if you do like the idea of shooting at 1.2, if you like the idea of being able to shoot the lens wide open, then yes, that's going to be a benefit to you. Again, there's choices when it comes to zoom lenses. So how do you choose between a 24 to 72.8 and a 24 to 70 f4? They're aperture wise and quality wise, they can be very similar. If you stop them both down, they can look quite the same. But that f2.8 is gonna be a lot brighter in low light situations. The key thing to keep in mind is that when you're shooting a low light scene, and you're shooting at f4, or an aperture of f4, your ISO might need to be higher. If you then shoot at 2.8, your ISO can be lower. So your aperture setting in those lenses affects other things. It's not just you buying it for the quality of that lens. There's also all the other things that a 2.8 aperture would let you shoot, or an f4 aperture would let you shoot. So it's not just as simple as this lens is better than this lens. 
it comes down to everything else that you would want to photograph as well. Rest assured, all of the Z mount lenses are incredibly good. Um, there isn't a lens that I, you know, I've not been happy with. They're all really good, and I don't think you could ever make the wrong choice. And that kind of really makes the choice. In to some cases, it might make that choice a little bit harder, um, but in some cases, it might make it a little bit easier because all you really need to do is choose the focal length and the aperture that you want, and you know that you're going to get a good quality lens. So. For me, you know, favorite lenses that we use, um, I really like, as I mentioned, this 100 to 400, um, and I've got to spend a bit of time with that, which is really nice. Um, I also thoroughly enjoy using the 51.8 and the 14 to 24 2.8. The question we get is, should I go for like a 14 to 24, or should I go for a 14 to 30 f4? And that's, again, that kind of 2.8 against the f4. But those ultra wide angle lenses are sometimes often referred by landscape photographers or architecture photographers as like their lenses. So if you're an architecture photographer or if you're a landscape photographer and you're in a situation where you think, should I go for a 2.8 or should I go for an f4? Does it really matter if I'm going to use that lens stopped down all the time anyway? Am I going to get the benefit of going to the 2.8? So that again is can be a difficult decision and one of the things that we always come back and say is well you know are you just shooting just landscapes like if it's just landscape stuff then you're in a situation where you're shooting in good light you're mainly shooting at f8 or f11 and therefore the 14 to 30 f4 is going to be great for that if you're in a situation however where you're shooting lots of landscapes but also then nightscapes or night sky shots as well so if you're shooting the milky way if you're shooting northern lights the 2.8 on the 14 24 2.8 all of a sudden becomes a much bigger advantage yes it doesn't make all that much difference when you're shooting in the daytime but it can make a huge difference when you're shooting at night just to take in a lot more light from that lens versus the f4 now don't get me wrong i've still got some great milky way shots with the 14 to 30 f4 but that 14 to 24 2.8 allows you to take more light in requiring a lower iso and therefore you get a better picture quality so there's always positives and negatives. And obviously, in general, the 2.8 range of lenses, like the 24 to 70, the 14 to 24, are higher quality. They are going to be sharper in the corners. They are going to give you more consistently higher quality images. The question you would have to ask yourself is, are they going to be noticeable qualities or noticeable things that would improve my image quality as well. So for me, I have my favorite lenses and I know what lenses are going to be right for me. And I appreciate that there's always these questions that we get about lenses. Should I buy this one? Should I buy that one? Hopefully I've given you a little bit of insight into which lenses are going to be right for you, which lenses you might want to consider buying as well. Now, the obviously lenses are always going to be coming out. There's always going to be new lenses. So it's always worth making sure that you're buying the right lens for you and being aware, as I mentioned earlier, about what's on the roadmap. So you know what lenses are up and coming because you might buy a 100 to 400 but there's also a 200 to 600 on the roadmap now that 200 to 600 could be a focal length that suits you better and it's a choice that you kind of have to you know do you wait do you hold out for that new lens to be available or do you jump in with the 100 to 400 it's a tough decision um, but there's hopefully enough detail around the 100 to 400, and there's hopefully enough detail around you know, the, the ability to of what you can shoot at 400 mil versus what you can shoot at 600 mil to give you an insight into which lens is going to be best for you. Keep in mind that if you do need a 100 to 400 to be a longer focal length, as we talked about earlier, we can still use those teleconverters as well. So as a, as a whole, Z mount lenses, they offer incredible performance. There's a wide range of different lenses available. 1.8s, 1.2s, as we talked about. We then get that ability to go to those longer focal lengths as well, especially with the 100 to 400, which I really like if I've mentioned that before. Um, so they're, they're really nice lenses. Now, the technology inside of these does surpass what is in F-mount lenses. And it's incredibly common to see a lot of Z-mount lenses surpassing the quality and the technology of what is in an F-mount lens. And there's a lot of Z-mount equivalents of the older um, F-mount equivalents that outperform those older F-mount equivalents. They give you a lot more performance and a lot higher quality. The level of quality has changed as well. What generally tended to happen was with F-mount lenses, you kind of had to buy the best F-mount lens um, to get kind of the best quality. Whereas with Z-mount lenses, even the, um, the, the smaller and the lighter lenses 
are still incredibly good quality. Um, Nikon recently released two very small and lightweight primes, a 28 millimeter and a 40 millimeter. And these lenses are incredibly small and lightweight, but they offer incredibly good picture quality for their size. These again are either an f2.8 or an f2. So they're still quite bright, and, but they're still mainly built around the ability to be able to be shot with a small camera and a small lens. They keep your entire kit really nice and small and lightweight. So. Hopefully, there's a choice for everybody. And don't feel like there's a Z lens that doesn't offer you the great quality that you expect because all of them have been truly fantastic. So hopefully, it gives you a little bit of an insight into different lenses. Hopefully, it gives you an insight into what different Z mount lenses there are. Some of my favorites, some of the Z mount lenses you might want to look, keep an eye on in the future as well. Hopefully, that's been useful for you guys. Thank you very much. And I will see you soon.